friends. Welcome to Bethel First Presbyterian Church in our digital worship today. As we begin, I have a few announcements to share, uh, including the fact that this coming Wednesday, uh, October 13th, I, I say that realizing I don't know when you're watching this, so you might be watching it after the fact, so let me put an actual date on it. On October 13th, the session will meet. Uh, we'll meet at 5.30 uh, via a Zoom meeting. And during the course of this meeting, we will again discuss the nature of our worship and the status of future worship services as to where the uh, COVID situation is in our community. Um, our hope is that things will soon be back to normal, but how soon uh, and how normal, we do not yet know. So we, again, we thank you for your patience. Uh, but on the 13th, uh, be waiting for a message after that meeting to know a little bit more about the status of our worship in terms of digital and or in person. Um, as we are digital, it's, um, well, it's, it's weird preaching to an empty sanctuary. Again, I've already uh, told you guys that I don't like it because this flat screen that I talk to doesn't laugh at my corny jokes and groan like you all do. I don't get that feedback, but I thank you uh, for the times that we do have in person. This, I, I say that to say the sanctuary doesn't look normal, but there's one piece, one piece of the sanctuary, one segment of the sanctuary that is gaining or regaining some normalcy, and that's the first pew. Uh, those of you that are familiar with our worship and our um, giving habits as a, a mission endeavor know that Operation Christmas Child is a part of what this church does on an annual basis. And so, yes, it is that time of year again. The boxes are on the front pew. If you would like to participate in providing a bo gift box for children throughout the world, uh, in giving them uh, some tangible things as well as uh, a morsel of goodness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, this is a way of doing so. Collection week for these will be middle, uh, the middle of November. I think the 15th through the 22nd is the date that comes to mind. In fact, you will receive a more detailed email about uh, participation in Operation Christmas Child shortly uh, from the time of this worship service. If you do have questions about that, feel free to call me at the church office. Uh, that number is mentioned on the opening and ending uh, tag or, or frame of this video. Uh, it's also available um, in your local white pages, I'm sure, as well. Uh, but I I'll move on. Uh, Operation Christmas Child, that's what I have to say about that. Also, we have this Thanksgiving meal coming up. Our Thanksgiving committee is looking forward to uh, doing the meal again this year. However, knowing that serving meals in-house is just out of the question, we plan to do everything by delivery and uh, takeout orders. So uh, we're still gonna need a lot of helpers and we hope you're able to be a part of this. Uh, if you uh, would like to be a part of it, please feel free to contact Mike Thomas, Jane Horn, Jimmy Ewing, who's in charge of the drivers, uh, and myself. And we will again look forward to serving the community in a fashion that we've been blessed to do in the past. Those are the uh, community announcements as we begin today. But as we step into this time of worship, I ask you to bow your hearts and heads with me, asking God to bless us in our time together. Praying together, gentle God, you shepherd us in all times, including times of trouble. Scripture reminds us that when the way seems dark, you are present. You guide us safely through. When we cannot bear to slow down in our own lives, you show us the wisdom of Sabbath rest. Lord, we know that in your presence there is life, and this life is overflowing and abundant and free. And as we rest in your goodness in a time of worship, we pray that you would teach us, dear Lord, to see with your heart and your eyes. Open our eyes to the world beyond our own existence and beyond our small town to all your beloved children, both near and far. Lord, open our hearts to the beauty and goodness of your creation, which sustains us 
and yet is more powerful than we can begin to imagine. Lord, anoint us with your spirit of blessing that we might be as Christ to one another in our welcome, in our compassion, and in our care. Again, we pray for you to bless us as we worship you today. Amen. Join me in the call to worship. We give you thanks for the gift of this day, for you alone are good. We praise you for your love for all people, for you alone are good. We rejoice in your presence, for you alone are good. Guide us to rely on you all our days, so that we may be well in your sight. Now let us lift our voices together in our opening hymn, Alleluia, Sing to Jesus.
friends in Scripture, we are reminded that the proof of God's amazing love for us can be found in this matter. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. And because we have faith in Christ, we dare to approach God with confidence in our hearts and in our minds. And so as we humble ourselves this morning, may we unify our voices in joining this prayer, confessing our sins before God and neighbor. God of our salvation, we often seek salvation in places where it simply cannot be found. We fall into the illusion that possessions, the stuff we own or the stuff we desire, can give us fulfillment and lasting joy. We are deluded into believing that we are self-made individuals and that if we just work hard enough, we can find happiness and success through our own efforts. Open our eyes to see that you alone are good. Help us to recognize both your love for us and our dependence on you for that which truly gives us satisfaction and life. Give us the courage and confidence to follow you. Amen. Friends, as we conclude this prayer, may we be reminded that Jesus knows us. And that doesn't mean he just knows the good us, the, the happy face that we put on or the, the ways that we kind of dress ourselves up. Jesus knows us completely. He knows our every weakness and loves us even still. <laughs> I hope you heard that. Loves us even still. And so may we awaken to the promise of God's amazing love for us in and through Christ. And may we know in our heart of hearts the truth of the gospel promise that in Jesus Christ our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Please join me for the prayer for illumination. Almighty God, in you are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Open our eyes that we may see the wonders of your word and give us grace that we may clearly understand and choose the way of your wisdom. Through Christ our Lord, amen. The first scripture reading today is from Psalms chapter 90, verses 12 through 17. So teach us to count our days that we may gain a wise heart. Turn, O Lord, how long? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love so that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad as many days as you have afflicted us, and as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be manifest to your servants, and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us, and prosper for us that work of our hands. O oh, prosper the work of our hands. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. I have a knife, a very sharp knife with me today. And knives should only be used with adult supervision. Now, I want you to think of some ways that knives can be used. Now, knives can be used to hurt people, but they can also be used for many good purposes, like cutting your food and performing surgery. Now, surgery is done in an operating room where the patient has been put to sleep and given painkillers. The letter to Hebrews that Reverend Murphy is going to read about in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says that the word of God is like a knife, living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit. Now, I know there's a lot of big words in there, but what that means is sometimes our spirits are closed up and we don't want to let God inside. But the word of God can open us up like a surgeon using a knife. And it isn't meant to hurt us, but to help us. Like surgery can make a sick patient well. Jesus' teachings can open us up to what God wants us to do, including loving our neighbors, 
praying for those who are mean or hurt us and confessing our sins to the to the Lord and giving to the poor. Now, remember, I said that the word of God is equally sharp like this knife, but it is used to heal and never hurt. Let us bow our heads and pray. Dear Lord, thank you that your word opens our hearts. Help us to show others how to love with your word. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Now, as we turn to our second reading this morning, we are turning to the fourth chapter of Hebrews, beginning in the twelfth verse. It is here that we read these words. Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him... No creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So as we begin our reflection and thoughts on this passage from Hebrews this morning, I'm going to ask you to think of the products that you use in your everyday life. For example, in the course of an ordinary day, uh, how about that razor that you shave with in the morning or the toothbrush that you use? Then maybe into the kitchen, how about the microwave? The microwave you use to heat up your oatmeal or whatever your preferred breakfast is. Maybe we could consider the automobile, that product that you use to get on to work and continue your day. And then at work, is it maybe a laptop and the use of your smartphone that helps you navigate in and through the workday itself? Products in life are used minute by minute hour by hour, day by day, all the way through to that light bulb that we turn off as we head home and call the day, or call quits to the day, call the day to its end. Now I mentioned these products to ask this question. What is the common thread? What common thread do these products that I mentioned and the many more that you can imagine, what do they have in common? What trait do they share? Well, if you've got any guesses, uh, they might range from here to there, but the answer, or at least the answer for our purposes in this reflection is that all of these products are extensively tested. Yes, tested, rigorously tested. And everything that we see on our shelves and that we use day in and day out is indeed tested from beginning to end, top to bottom, up and down. Trust me. And products that we use have testing standards, and they've got to for liability purposes. I mention the word or, or the concept of testing, being tested, because one of the key words we encounter in our text in Hebrews today is tested. We read it in verse 15, where we read that Jesus was in every respect tested. Jesus endured extensive and rigorous testing. In Scripture, we hear about certain accounts of the times that this happened, and probably the quickest one that comes to mind is the temptation narrative. Uh, the temptation narrative actually uh, happens in all of the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And Matthew and Luke go into a little more detail in their telling of the narrative than, than does Mark. 
The details that they cover basically indicate that Jesus was tempted in three broad areas. Make bread out of stones to relieve his own hunger. Jump from the pinnacle and rely on the angels to break his fall. Again, the narratives of Luke and Matthew even have Satan quoting scripture from Psalm 91 verses 11 and 12 as a kind of a way of saying God has really said this is okay. You know, God has promised his assistance in this manner. And then the third of these tests is to worship Satan and in return receive all of the kingdoms of the world. In John's gospel, we hear these temptations categorized as the lust of the flesh, the eyes, and the pride of life. We could call them hedonism, materialism, and egoism. In any sense, they, they cover the basic tests all of us face as humans. He, of course, does not give in. He passes these tests. And my, my point is not getting bogged down anyhow in the meaning of the temptation narrative in its details. Merely, I want to again introduce the existence of the temptation narrative to say that Jesus was tested. That he was tested is what matters. And we see in this story further proof of what the Hebrews author is talking about. Later in his life and ministry, tested in other ways, Jesus uh, often encountered the religious elite who were trying to undo him. So a quick scan of some of these entries and examples would take us to Matthew 16, verse 1, where we see the Pharisees and Sadducees came, testing him and asked him to show them a sign from heaven. Matthew 19, verse 3. The Pharisees came to him, testing him and saying, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? They weren't really wanting to know. They were trying to trap him. Matthew twenty-two seventeen and 18. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? The last one in Matthew uh, or the last example I'm going to use today is 22, 35, and 36, where he says, One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? We move from Matthew to the Gospel of Mark, and here we read, They sent some of the Pharisees and of the Herodians to him, that they might trap him with words. When they had come, they asked him, Teacher, we know that you are honest and don't defer to anyone. If you aren't partial to anyone but truly teach the way of God, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we give or shall we not give? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why do you test me? Bring me a denarius that I may see it. Moving on from the Gospel of Mark, we find other tests in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, chapter 10, verse 25, Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? As he said these things to them, the scribes and Pharisees began to be terribly angry and to draw many things out of him, lying in wait for him and seeking to catch him in something they might say that they might accuse him. Something he might say that they might accuse him. Pardon my stumbling around there. Then we move from the Gospel of Luke to the Gospel of John. And in John, we hear the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman taken in adultery. Having set her in the middle, they told him, Teacher, we found this woman in adultery in the very act. Now in our law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. What then do you say about her? They said this, testing him, that they might have something to accuse him of. Jesus was tested. Tested by Satan, tested by humans with motives 
that were less than helpful, motives that were actually meant to be quite destructive. And when the results came in, the verdict of Jesus facing all of these tests was without sin, blameless, faultless. Unfortunately, you and I have a different outcome in the testing scenario. We too are tested often in exhausting, often in demanding and demeaning ways. However, for us, when the results come in, they're different than Jesus's response. Our response is we are broken. We are flawed. We are in need of further development. We are not yet ready to be introduced to the general public. Yet, here we are. And when you hear that verdict about yourself and, comes to, and come to grips with it and come to terms with what that means, to whom do you turn given such a reality? Well, the answer to this question is you turn to your product liability attorney, right? And of course, for us, we have one, scripturally speaking, and he's the best. In 1 John 2, we read, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. This is a legal term. He's our defense counsel with God, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. And that's why the writer of Hebrews can confidently say, let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness. And then backing up, taking a step back from this confident conclusion, there's an additional observation that we can and should take from Hebrews chapter 14 and or chapter 4 verses 14 through 16 that is uh, the assumed word of God that's so often translated simply as the Bible, uh, the whole of the Old Testament and the New Testament combined and neatly bound together. And while this is true in a certain sense that that is the word of God, as we read in Hebrews here, we shouldn't miss the detail and the point that this word is living and active. It is to say it's not just a dusty book that can be picked up or left alone on a shelf. Neither is it just a collection of a bunch of quotes that can be taken cleverly out of context, although this does happen from time to time, and it can be somewhat entertaining and humorous. Uh, for instance, there was a well-known Christian magazine, it is said, that once carried an ad for God balls. These were golf balls. It was a set of four, and each of the four was inscribed with a Bible verse, all, of course, in the King James Version because it was royalty-free right? If you're going to make a profit, make as much profit as you can. But here are the verses that appeared on these four golf balls. Matthew seven fourteen. because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. That's Matthew seven fourteen. kind of funny. The other uh, golf ball, the second golf ball had Psalm 75, 7. But God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. Or Psalm 23, 2, the familiar 23rd Psalm. Can you guess which part of that is chosen? He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. The fourth golf ball in the pack had this quote from Ezekiel 34, 16. I will seek that which is lost and bring again that which was driven away. I will seek that which was lost and bring again that which was driven away. Well, again, kind of goofy. That would probably be my golf ball most of the time. But perhaps it's not exactly the best use of the word of the Lord. That's the point I was getting to when I went off on that little tangent. Instead, the word of the Lord is dynamic in its entirety. It is the living logos. It is the speech of the living God. This word, we are told, is sharper than any two-edged sword. 
And here the author uses, employs a metaphor of a physical sword, saying that the word of God pierces to the inner parts of the person, dividing both the bodily joint and marrow and the non-bodily soul and spirit in reference to the internal areas. Here the author's likely appealing to a um, philosophical, dualistic um, common thought that was held in the first century about the distinction between the soul and the spirit not being able to exist in the same realm in essence. But the writer doesn't spend time developing that philosophical thought. He just gives us a glancing past. That's all we see. But the point of the sword, <laughs> pardon that terminology, kind of didn't realize that when I put it together. The point of the sword image is to capture poetically and emphatically the ability of God's word to get into the inner nature of our humanity. That is our human heart, more than just the organ, but the heart, the inner sense of our being. And then additionally, this image of the sword calls forth images which are sacrificial in nature, or at least it would have called forth this image to someone living in that setting in that day and time. For you, I imagine you're somewhat like me. It might conjure up an image uh, more like knights fighting, King Arthur, Sir Lancelot, and the Knights of the Round Table, or maybe some bad Monty Python reruns, right? Or good Monty Python reruns. We'll, we'll not go there. But to say that we turn more to a, a medieval sword sort of image when we think of those things. I don't know. For you, it might be a different era in time. But certainly... I don't turn towards the sacrificial system of the first century and think about the action of the priests, but it's important to remember the original audience. So this use of a high priest image is in fact quite fitting, very fitting. That's the world they knew. That's the religion they saw and practiced. That's the, wood they came, the way they came to understand the concept of atonement. Atonement. In our world, we might call that getting right with God. And this high priest language was first introduced earlier in the letter. Chapter 2, verse 17. We see it again in our reading today. And as we read further in Hebrews in the weeks to come, we will come to see the author focuses his attention on Jesus' priesthood in a very intentional way. The priestly role of Jesus. We talk about Jesus as prophet, priest, and king. And this is where a lot of that imagery of priestly uh, description of Jesus comes from. So for this very reason, verses 14 through 16, act as both a buffer and a comfort, a, a comfort to the warning of verse 13, which talked about all things being laid bare, and that sounds very threatening, you know, things being laid bare by the sword. But this buffer and this comfort transitions as the author moves to the introduction to the next segment of the letter about the atoning work of Christ. Now let me close this week and set up next week by saying this. In verse 14, the writer lists several qualities of Jesus as the high priest. He talks about his greatness. He talks about his location in the heavens and his status as the Son of God. And the author is introducing and setting up a comparison he will be making between Jesus and the other high priests. These high priests are earthbound. And while they're not outsiders in the family of God, they claim Abraham and Levi as their most immediate ancestors. As opposed to Jesus. When he talks about his family lineage, he connects himself directly to God. And even more than this distinction, there is also the fact that Jesus is able to sympathize with humans because he has been tested. Remember where we started our conversation today? He has been thoroughly, thoroughly tested and tempted in every way while the priests 
of the temple are only able to moderate and mediate between their subjects and God. You see, Jesus is more than our mediator. And although he was tempted in every respect as ordinary mortals are, he never sinned. He stood where we stand, so he knows what we need. He was tested time and again, and time and, time and again he proved he was truly who he claimed to be, doing what he came to do. Amen. Friends, will you join me as we unite our hearts and minds in prayer? And may we begin our prayer this morning with a moment of quietness, a moment of silence for us to speak our heart's concerns between us and God. Let us pray together. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. And we pray to you, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, and use me as your will directs. May I seek you in your direction, and may I seek obedience to your will with my heart, my soul, and my strength. Lord, just a few moments from now, we will conclude in song, and one of the verses we will sing is, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Wounded and weary, help me, I pray. Power, all power, surely is thine. Touch me and heal me, Savior divine. As much as we seek your will, 
we seek your healing. And we seek to be messengers of this truth and this promise. We thank you for your faithfulness to us. And our prayer is that we can return your faithfulness to us with our faithfulness to you, doing for you things that please you as we seek to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself. Lord, as we are united in prayer, hear us as we pray for our nation and the world and the various concerns we hear of daily in these arenas, in these regards. And we pray also that you would hear matters of concern closer to our own homes, closer to our own lives, as we pray for our church, for our family and friends. This morning we lift to you Mary and Kara, Morris, Teresa, Terry and Ray, Bethany and Anne, Janice, Carolyn, Faye and Tuddy, Jerry, Sue, and Molly. We pray for Gary and Frank, Sam and Tammy, Kevin and Pat. We lift up Sylvia and Michael, Wendell and Nolan. We pray today for the Rudzik family and Raina, for Lacey and Debbie, for Mary, Joanne, Cless, Tandy, we pray for Mary Ellen and Kay and Mary Jo. Lord, we also pray for our own congregation in Presbytery of Mid-Kentucky. And in addition, we pray for our U.S. troops, for the Higby family, and for Jordan and Jenny Smith as they go about their mission work in Togo, West Africa. We pray for ongoing events in the world. Again, the unrest in Haiti and Afghanistan and those still recovering from recent storms on the Gulf Coast and through the Northeast. Hear us as we continue to pray for strength and endurance for our healthcare workers our emergency medical responders, and our educators. Lord, we also continue to pray for the Mason family in his loss. And we conclude our prayer in familiar words you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen.
Friends, thank you for being here with us this week. And in our time together, we have joined as the body of Christ virtually. And as we have joined together as the body of Christ, we have been fed body and spirit with the very bread of life. And so now, encouraged, nourished, and strengthened, let us share the good news of the gospel with all we encounter. Friends, now as you go about your day, know that you go with the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen and amen.